Welcome back to the three months of modal logics with Carnades.org. We're going to continue our sequel to the 100 Days of Logic, kind of a Logic 201, with the Deontic Square Solution. Now, this is the solution to a puzzle we offered in the previous video. So, if you haven't seen that video or tried it, I highly suggest you go to the Deontic Non-Contradiction Challenge and give it a try right now. If you have a basic sense of the way to do logic and predicate calculus, but also the way to do deontic logic. This is kind of the first real test of your deontic logic skills here. But if you've tried it out for yourself and you want to check your proof, or you've completely given up and you want to see how I do it, let's move forward. So this is the proposition that we're trying to prove. We have our deontic non-contradiction axiom out front, we have an equivalent sign, that triple bar, and then we have listed the entire description of our deontic square put logically. In order to prove this, we have to prove that equivalence, the main operator of this whole premise, is the equivalence. And so, to prove an equivalence, you have to prove two conditionals. Equivalence is also known as a biconditional. It's a conditional that goes both ways. So we have to show that the deontic non-contradiction axiom implies the logical description of the deontic square and vice versa. The logical description of the deontic square implies the law of deontic non-contradiction. So in order to do this, we're going to do a couple conditional proofs, as you may have guessed. So, first off, we're going to start with an assumed conditional proof, assuming this large, longer predicate, and going on to, or proposition rather, and going on to the smaller one. The reason I do this, and generally do this, is it's easier to take a big long premise like this and figure out how it breaks down to the smaller one and that can kind of help you figure out how you can build the smaller one back up to the bigger premise here. So we have all of our logical description of the deontic square in premise one as an assumed conditional proof and we're going to try to prove from this the law of deontic non-contradiction. So from that, what we're going to do right now in the description, we have a bunch of obligatories, omissibilities, impermissibilities, permissibilities, blah, 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 all of these different things. It's hard to function with a premise like that. And we are aware that all of these definitions are defined in terms of obligation. So the first thing we're going to want to do is change them all into obligation, what they mean in terms of obligations. So we're going to use premise one, our deontic definitions, and a little bit of double negation, because the technical way our definitions are framed, we might end up with a couple double negatives here or there. And we're going to transform this first premise just into a list of obligations. It is effectively the same thing. We've just now phrased it in terms of obligation instead of in terms of all of these other concepts that we've been learning about. All right? So that's a lot of uses of deontic definitions and maybe one or two uses of double negation. Then what we're going to do is if you look at the first two parts of our conjunction, the obligation of P is equivalent to obligation that P and obligation that not P is equivalent to obligation that not P. You'll note that both of those are tautologies. Both of those are things that aren't going to be equivalent to our deontic non-contradiction axiom because they're just tautologies that you could prove with just the deontic equivalence axiom and the laws of logic. So we're not going to need those. We're going to simplify those out and just be left with kind of this shorter conjunction. Next up, we're going to do two things. We're going to take our conjunctions, these two conjunctions, and we're going to turn them into disjunctions. And we're going to take our two implications, and we're going to turn those into disjunctions as well. Because right now, we have too many different symbols going on in this. We have too many different kinds of logical operators that don't play well together. We're going to want to change as many as we can into disjunctions. So instead of having two parts of this premise with conjunctions and two parts with implications, we now have four parts that all are represented with disjunction. So they're kind of all the same style, all right? Now, it should be clear that we can simplify out one of these premises, and effectively, if you look, all of these are basically the same premise. If you look carefully at all four of those, you just switch back and forth. It's not the case that it's obligatory that P or 
it's not the case it's obligatory that not p. All of those four things are just saying the same thing. So we can really easily simplify out just that one statement because that's all this is saying. It's a conjunction of four equivalent statements. And then all we have to do is take that and use De Morgan's law to get it's not the case, it's obligatory that P and it's obligatory that not P, which was our goal from the beginning. So in fewer steps than you might think it would have taken us, we've gotten from our logical description of the deontic square to our deontic non-contradiction axiom. And so we can write this as an implication where we list all of the deontic square description and then that implies the axiom of non-contradiction for deontic logic premise 1 through 6 conditional proof. All right? The other way is going to be a little bit harder, but that's just because we have to add a lot of things to our axiom of non-contradiction. But we're going to effectively use the same steps just in almost reverse order. So pay attention to these steps. If you had trouble with this proof and you want to try it now going the other direction, I'd highly encourage you pause the video now and try it the other way around. All right, so let's move on. So now we're going to do another assumed conditional proof. All right, we'll draw our line going down. This time we're assuming the deontic non-contradiction axiom. Then we're going to, once again, just doing the reverse of what we did last time. So we're going to use De Morgan's law, distribute the negation, and get this or statement. Then we're going to use commutivity because, remember, we had both versions in our previous premise we had both it's not the case it's obligatory that p and or it's not the case it's obligatory that not p and the switch around of that it's not the case that it's obligatory that not p or it's not the case it's obligatory that p we had both of those in our really long premise that we had earlier if you want to pause the video and go back and see that for yourself you can do that but what we're going to do now is we're going to take premise 9 and 10 and we're going to use conjunction in fact we're going to use conjunction twice to get the equivalent of that previous premise that was just four conjuncts that are the same. So four conjuncts that are equivalent to each other, just a commutation of the terms. So we just move the terms around, we switch the terms with each other. That's all we've done right here. We've just conjoined a bunch of versions of premise 9 and premise 10 together into one long conjunction that is going to be equivalent to that other piece that we saw there. So now, once again, remember last time we wanted to get rid of those extra symbols and we wanted to get everything down to disjunction. We have to do the opposite of that. So we're going to go from our disjunctions to conjunctions using De Morgan's Law and from some other disjunctions to implications using implication. And we're going to do this to kind of mirror. You look at our final goal. We have two conjunctions at the beginning and then two implications. So we're going to kind of want two and two, two, and two conjunctions and then two implications. And if you look at the previous premise, you'll see this is kind of similar. This is why I like doing the larger, more complicated premise down to the smaller premise, because you can kind of really just work backwards on things like this. All right, next we're going to do just a logical truth. Remember that block T means a tautology. P is equivalent to P. Then using our Dantic equivalence axiom, we'll get it's obligatory that P is equivalent to it's obligatory that P. We're going to do another tautology, not P is equivalent to not P. And then once again with the Dantic equivalence axiom, we have it's obligatory that not P is equivalent to it's obligatory that not P. Why did we just do that? Well, you may remember when we were simplifying down that big long description of the deontic square, we got rid of two tautologies. We got rid of a tautology that said it's obligatory that P is equivalent to it's obligatory that P, and we got rid of a tautology that says that it's obligatory that not P is equivalent to it's obligatory that not P. So we're going to need those two premises involved in our final conjunction, our final long conjunction. So we're going to conjoin those two first, premise 14 and 16 conjunction, and then we're going to conjoin both of those with everything we've gotten so far. And this should look very, very similar to our premise as we had it as soon as we had translated everything just to obligation. It should be an identical premise or a very similar premise to that premise, and definitely equivalent to it through 1217 conjunction. All right, so we're going to restate that so you can just kind of see how this works. That was premise 18, same thing we had on the last page. 
and then we're going to go to premise 19 here we're just going to translate back all we're doing is deontic definitions over and over and over again and maybe some double negation in there but a lot of uses of deontic definitions of how obligation is defined in terms of our other terms because we need to get our omissibility our impermissibility our permissibility back into this definition all right so we've done that and we've ended up with our final goal our goal of having the description of the deontic square proven by the deontic non-contradiction axiom so we can finish our conditional proof by saying that the non deontic non-contradiction axiom implies the logical description of the deontic square 8 through 19 conditional proof Whew. and now we have two really, really long implications, and I'm not going to write them here. And this is a cool trick for logic if you're doing a logical proof and you don't want to write out a really long premise. You can actually do this. Put the name of the premise or the name of the line in square brackets like this. So what I'm saying here is I have a conjunction between premise 7 and premise 20 because both those premises are really long and it wouldn't be too productive for me to write them out. It's telling the reader that if you want to know what's going in here, just look back to premise 7, look back to premise 20 and find out what's going on. So premise 7, premise 20, conjunction, and as we understand, equivalence, if we conjoin two conditionals going in opposite directions with the same antecedents and consequence, we can eventually conclude an equivalence. So premise 21, equivalence, will conclude our actual conclusion that the deontic non-contradiction axiom is equivalent to the logical description of the deontic square. Okay, I realize that there were a lot of moving parts there, there were a lot of pieces to each of those premises, but honestly, when you get to more and more complicated logic, you have these really long premises, and it's important to take your time. I'm not even sure I've done every single one of these steps correctly. The general arc of it is correct, but there may be a missing closed parenthesis here or there, or an extra negation thrown in somewhere I didn't want it. The point is that these proofs are long and difficult to do. But if you have a general idea of how you're going to do them, a general idea of which steps you're going to take, you've accomplished the main goal we have here. If you miss a negation here or miss a closed parenthesis here, that's not the end of the world. The point is that you're understanding how to use the deductive rules of logic that we've given you and the deontic rules that we've now added to those to prove something. All right? So, if you tried that and succeeded, I'd encourage you to try the deontic trifold as well. Go back to the previous video and give it a try. If you tried that and failed as well, I'd give you encouragement to try the deontic trifold. There's going to be a similar process between these two to solving the deontic trifold and solving the deontic square. So, watch a new video every single day for yet another 100 days here at carnades.org and stay skeptical, everybody.